I think this is definitely officially the biggest crowd in the picking <laughs> The first one that I spoke at was scheduled for a boardroom where we all sat around the table and 150 people showed up. <laughs> so this is not totally unprecedented. Um, anyway, uh, I think several months later, I think it's still too early to say how long Piketty fever will last. Uh, I was going to say maybe it was over, but I think probably not. Um, there's definitely been a backlash, and of course there was always going to be a backlash from the right, but I think there's also been a little bit more of a, a backlash in some of the mainstream or the, the liberal ends of the economics profession as well. Maybe we can talk a little bit about it. The main argument can be summed up in just a few graphs. There's no, you know, all you really need to see in this first graph is the shape. This is income inequality in the US, 1910 to the present, and it's basically just the share of the top decile in national income. All you need to know about it really is that it went down precipitously around World War II, stayed down for a few decades, and then started rising again from 1980. So he, he argues that you need uh, capital, uh, incomes to capital for that reason, but the people who have it mostly have it through pure luck. He's got figures on how much of capital has been inherited as to how much accumulated within individuals' lifetimes, at least for France. And the figures there are that about two-thirds of wealth is inherited, according to French data. And his projection is that's going to rise to about 80% in the not-too-distant future. Uh, it's never going to be the technocrats that are going to be adjusting these policies just on the basis of rational argument. It's really up, up, up to us to, to build the movement, I suppose, and, and make them a little bit more afraid. <laughs> thanks. OK, well, thanks, Mike. I'll, I'll build on some of those points, I guess. I, I guess I'd say I don't think the reason Piggy's book was a big hit in 2014 was because people were reading it, recommending their friends, and doing this stuff. It was because the ground had already been prepared, uh, partly, I should say, by Piggy himself, but very notably in the US context by the Occupy movement. All of the above average growth is concentrated in the 1%. And indeed, even the 1% slogan, which Joe Stiglitz came up with a year ago, it turns out to be peeling an onion. You know, the, if you make it over into 1%, you suddenly realise you haven't actually made it. It's the 0.1% uh, who are actually making out. The, the, one, the 0.9 of a percent is only just going ahead of the mob. And it keeps on going from the 0.1% to the 0.01% to Go. In our context, Gina Reinhardt and James Packer and a dozen other people taking a huge share of national income. So, so for me, I guess I'm, I, I am sceptical for the some, same kind of reasons of some of the analysis in Piketty. I think what he does <coughs> most effectively and what's most readable and accessible, which is why I recommend the book to everybody, is to remind people of what a society based on inherited wealth looks like. You know, just because an idea sounds radical, like a 70% marginal tax rate, uh, and just because the Bill Shortens and Abbotts and, and everybody, you know, all, the, all the political elite see as unthinkable doesn't mean it can't actually be done. And I suppose that's the, uh, I think that, you know, I think we are a long way back from mobilising in fact. We have, you know, before we mobilise we have to, have to raise in people's minds the, the point that we're not all benefiting from this and, and overcome the stigma of things like class warfare. I mean, a great slogan coming out, out of the Occupy movement was, uh, they only called it class warfare when, when we started fighting back. And I think that's... Um, uh, Piketty uh, looks at how economics is studied. He attacks the undue enthusiasm for simplistic mathematical models that constitute mainstream economic study. In one of the best quotes in the book, he says, to put it bluntly, this, the discipline of economics has yet to get over its childish passion for mathematics and for purely theoretical and often highly ideological speculation at the expense of historical research and collaboration with the other social sciences. Of course, if you think the big questions of economics have been resolved, then what is there left to do? Piketty makes the point starkly when he opens his first chapter with the terrible events of the Marikana Mine Massacre in South Africa. 35 striking miners from the Marikana miner were shot dead in 2012. They were demanding a doubling of their wages from 500 to 1,000 euros per month. 
the mine manager purportedly earned a million euros and they were striking against that as well. This is the reality of free market capitalism today, not in the, not in the 1800s. Things like health and education and uh, social services, but actually to redistribute wealth. And that's what he's talking about. It's not enough to have these things, which we've got to really hold on to. Medicare and our access to universities and the, you know, the unemployment payments. But actually, he talks about redistribution of wealth, which I think is, is, uh, is fantastic. If such tax rates seem unbelievable in Australia, but just, uh, just after World War II, the top, the top income tax rate was 93%. In the US, around the same period, Roosevelt introduced a top tax rate of 80%. It's almost unbelievable. I didn't know that. I thought it was incredible. Can anyone... Um, and I think these proposals are not necessarily original, but they show up the timidity, for example, of the policies of the Labor Party. Um, the party that is meant to be doing something about inequality um, in our society. Can you even imagine Labor proposing anything <laughs> remotely like this um, now in the current, the current circumstances? Uh, the G20 arrives in Brisbane November um, 15. Um, and I think the ideas of Piketty are very useful in terms of building an effective opposition. And those, those 20 nations who are coming here are coming here essentially for an austerity summit. All of their policies are about making um, poor people in their own economies pay for the problems that they've created and giving a hand out to the rich. On the 10th, uh, Musgrave Park will be a place to go to have that discussion, talking about the problems with the G20, but also talking about alternatives that we want to pursue, human alternatives based on need, not profit. Um, on the 14th, there's going to be a big public meeting, um, and we, the speakers are uh, international speakers. And on the 15th, we're going to have a, a People's March, starting at Roman Street Forum and going to Musgrove Park. Now, on that march, I guess the main challenge will be trying to work out how to get confiscatory uh, taxation into a chair. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure we can do it. There are some pretty clever people out there. So the march is going to be a big, a big people's event. I guess the main thing from this room, if you could go away and be a builder of that march, to take posters, to leave your name, to tell your friends and colleagues that the place to be uh, on November 15 is at this rally. And I guess it's for two reasons. It's because there are two billion people out there who are being misrepresented by these people. And we want to say that we understand the issues and we condemn what they've done to your economies and to your way of life. And the other thing is we want to rebuild progressive and left politics in Brisbane so that when Newman and Abbott come back for more of our services, we've got a big united opposition to say get stuffed. So that's the value of the 15th, to get people together and to, to put forward alternative economics, the kind that Piketty's been referring to.